Here we are in Jerusalem in an olive grove, and what an amazing privilege to be here during the Easter season. Absolutely. We are on a tour with 95 of our friends, many of them here for the first time, including me. We're going to be exploring the very sites where the Easter story took place. That is coming right up. Welcome to the special edition of 100 Huntley Street. Greg, Cheryl, and Maggie here with you. And ladies, we are on a pilgrimage overlooking the old city of Jerusalem where the Passion Week took place. It's been such a remarkable time. We've, yeah. We're going to be visiting holy sites where historians and traditions say that the last days of Jesus' life on earth took place, mm -hmm. including the Garden of Gethsemane, the Via Della Rosa, and the Holy Sepulchre Church. And this being my first time, it was emotional walking down the Via Della Rosa and imagining Jesus carrying his cross on his way to Golgotha. And the reminder, again, during this Easter season of the redemption of his resurrection and his death throughout this time. You know, speaking of redemption, uh, I traveled to Bethlehem. I met a lady whose husband was killed because of his faith in Jesus. And she'll be sharing her story of healing and forgiveness. That's coming up a little bit later. On. So in yesterday's episode, we visited the northern part of Israel, including the Sea of Galilee, looking at places where Jesus' ministry began. Today, we're going to visit the holy sites, including Judea, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, continuing the journey, the sites of Jesus' Passion Week. Our journey today began where it all began, in Bethlehem. The Church of the Nativity holds a special significance to Christians as the traditional location for the birthplace of Jesus. Within the church is a grotto, which is considered the oldest site continuously used as a place of worship in Christianity today. Next, our group traveled to the Mount of Olives overlooking the Old City. It is here that several key events in the life of Jesus as related in the Gospels took place. The New Testament tells of Jesus ascending to heaven from the Mount of Olives. It's actually a bit surreal. I don't know if you found that this whole trip. Greg had a chance to read from the book of Acts as our group sat and soaked in the surroundings. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with? Holy Spirit. But you will receive, I love this, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He knew, of course, and his followers would find out how important it would be to have the Holy Spirit. Because the battle would really rage up. And as you know, most of the disciples were martyred and killed. And the beginning of the church, and, and even today, Christians are dying for their faith in Jesus. And that's one of the things I do, travel around and meet believers in Christ that are suffering today. They need the Holy Spirit in, in order to continue to advance this message of the amazing gospel. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes in a cloud from him in their sight. So look up. Let's just, let's just for a moment use our imaginations. We're there, and all of a sudden he starts to rise. So look up into the sky. As they were intently looking to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, and as we're reminded, they weren't the brightest guys out there. Um, I mean, they, they, Jesus was telling them what was gonna happen, but they still missed it, and unfortunately, so do we many times. They said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus, whoa, the same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back 
in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. And then the great king of glory is going to return. And this is where he's coming back. He's not coming back to Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's coming back to Jerusalem. So let's, Father, we thank you for Jesus, that he came and he died for our sins and he rose again. And for 40 days he was here and then he was taken up into heaven. And as he was taken up, as we know from the word of God, that he will return in the same way. And Father, I pray that you would fill us again with that Holy Spirit that Jesus himself promised we would receive so that we could be the witnesses that you've called us to be in this law, in this dark world that we live in today, that we would be those people that we'd give witness to the power of God and the love of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you have given us a path to heaven. And as you said, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman, no child gets to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And because we know that these things are true, because you did die, you rose, and you went into heaven, and you will return. And you've given us your Holy Spirit so that we can be these witnesses you've called us to be. So overwhelming. It's so beautiful. It's a dream come true. It's trip of a lifetime. And so when they speak, it's, um, it's deep. It's really deep. It's very touching. And uh, it's exciting to hear testimony. It's exciting to hear the teachings. My Easter will be different this time because I will see and experience every word in the scripture, every sermon I hear from the lens of God's word. It means so much more now. All of the things we celebrated and speak about at home is so much different here now. From here, many on the tour braved the cool, rainy weather to walk down the Mount of Olives, leading to the Garden of Gethsemane. According to the New Testament, the Garden of Gethsemane is a place that Jesus and his disciples regularly visited. It is also believed to be the place where Jesus went to pray on the night he was betrayed. At Easter, this is such an amazing place to be because we think about Jesus praying here so intently that he would actually sweat drops of blood. His desire was to get his will in line with the Father's will because he knew what he was facing, the humiliation, the agony that he'd face on the cross because he was making a path so that we could spend eternity with him. And as we reflect on Easter again, because often we go through Easter many times and yeah, we remember the stories, he died, he rose again, but to really think the price that Jesus paid for us so we could spend eternity with him is amazing. It was in this garden, again, where Jesus would literally lay down his will so that he would do the Father's will by being obedient, even in suffering, going to the cross, so that you and I could have eternal life with him. Shifting to the streets of the old city of Jerusalem, many of us were impacted by experiencing the Via Della Rosa. You know, we're on the path of the Via Della Rosa here in Jerusalem. Uh, Via Della Rosa, uh, suffering, sorrow, and pain. And Cheryl, to think Jesus was in this vicinity carrying his cross. Yeah, we're a couple meters above where ancient day Jerusalem would be, where Jesus would have walked. We know this is the area. And pilgrims come here. This is the traditional yep. place where they come and they remember the suffering that he did. And I know for, all, you know, Christians all around the world, and I, I know for me that, you know, again, to think the suffering, the abuse, Jesus was mocked and he was carrying that cross so that we could have eternal life. And I think, Cheryl, we just continue to need to reflect on that. I think the thing is, as Christians in this day and age, we lose our connection sometimes. We forget actually what he suffered for us and it becomes part of our life, but not in our heart. And coming to Israel and being a pilgrim like this is a time for us to really focus in and remember all that he did for us so that we could spend eternity with him. So behind me is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's the traditional place where they believe that Jesus was crucified and was buried. And I just went in there and uh, I got really emotional. I think just seeing so many pilgrims from around the world and thinking about you know, whether or not that's the site isn't really the point. It's about remembering what he did and valuing what he did and being grateful for what he did. And um, yeah, it's just, I think it's very overwhelming. And uh, I just came out just thanking him, thanking Jesus for what he did and, uh, and remembering that this, this was a real event in history that happened and it changed all of our lives, it changed my life. And I hope 
it's changing yours? I know this Easter for sure it's going to be very different because now being here, um, we just came out of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and I thought I was going to have all of this emotion and uh, it wasn't that, but it was more actually walking through the Via Della Rosa and just imagining Jesus walking down those streets and just the pain and the suffering that he was going through. I know Easter is just going to come alive in my mind as I read those scriptures that I've read so many times before and imagining where it actually happened. It's going to be amazing. You know, imagine having someone in your family killed because of their love for Jesus and simply wanting to share that amazing message. Well, that was the case for one such woman. Her name is Pauline, and I had the privilege of traveling to Bethlehem to hear her story. It made headlines across the world back in 2007. The murder of Rami Ayad, killed because he wouldn't back down from those who wanted to close his Bible Society bookshop in Gaza. Almost 12 years later, I had the opportunity to visit with Rami's widow, Pauline Ayad, in Bethlehem to hear her incredible story. Gaza is 1.4 million people, mostly Muslim, only a few thousand Christians. You knew it would be dangerous there. Were you concerned for Rami's safety and for you and your children? I was really concerned and uh, I was afraid of, of this uh, thing. When, when Rami was threatened sometimes, he used to tell me a sentence, what would they do? The most thing that they would do, they, they will kill me and then I will be a martyr for Jesus. Let's go back to October 5th, 2007. Rami knew that people were following him. Was he concerned? I remember on that Thursday, October 5th, he was coming back from work and he told me, Pauline, listen, I saw, I saw a car which, which was chasing me and he saw them, three, three men with beards, and, but for him he didn't want anyone to know about this. Saturday morning as he was going to work. I will never forget that look that he looked at my face in that morning. It was like his eyes were shining and he was looking over my, my body, you know, from head to toes, as if like he was saying goodbye. Later that day, Pauline had a strange feeling when Rami didn't come home for lunch. When she called him, he was vague about his whereabouts. A few hours later, when family members tried and got no answer, it became apparent he was in trouble. As uh, they were gathering in the church, one of the ladies was trying to call Rami as the others, and uh, and it, it suddenly it you know it, she heard the ringing. So that means that she reached him, but uh, one of the guys uh, uh, you know took the telephone from her, and and he because he was eager to know where is Rami, and so he spoke with Rami, and then Rami said you know. Uh, 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 I am away, you know, in two hours I'll be back, but I am in Rafah. They called me to, to, to tell me this information. In the same time, Rami just uh, uh, called me in that time. And, and I told him, Rami, I, I want you to explain really clearly to me what's happening because I am so worried about you. And he told me I am in a place far, far away and, you know, it, it will take time. And this was the last time I hear Rami's voice. So what happened on Sunday, October 7th? You know, about uh, 6 uh, uh, a.m. in the morning, you know, the, uh, my telephone rang. You know, my father uh, answered the telephone and it was Rami's brother talking. And I heard my father saying, so did you find him? In, in, in that time, I thought maybe they found him and he's like in the hospital and something good I'm going to hear about Rami. And he told me, uh, you are uh, a believer, and um, I just want to tell you that Rami uh, was found dead. So I was in total shock. I, I, of course, I didn't believe that news. I was, I was uh, uh, out of control, I was screaming. This devastating news sent Pauline, a pregnant mother of two, into a deep depression. 
She felt a great deal of anger and bitterness, not only towards her husband's killers, but also God. And then they used to tell me that, let, let us pray that our revenge for this man is to accept Jesus Christ. But of course, in that time, I, I really rejected all this talk. In that time, my, my, my feelings were that I want this guy to, to, to die in, in, in a very horrific way. And, and, and then after that, he would have another, another torture in, in hell because I didn't want him to, to accept Jesus Christ as his savior. So what changed? When you live in, in, a, in a such bitterness and, and hatred in the heart, you are the one to suffer. I was suffering. So I started to pray for the Lord. And I told him, Lord, I know that I am your daughter and I should forgive to those people, but I cannot. Help me. When I, when I forgive to, to those people, it would be a real forgiveness. So it took me about months and, or maybe about a year to pray the same prayer. Uh, and I, I believe that God was, was working in my life, the, doing great things in my life through some scriptures. And the most verse which, which really touched and spoke to my heart was from uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, saying that there is time for everything, a time for death and time for life. And, and God started to, to change the, the, the thoughts that I have in my mind. So I started to see this story in a different way. That this person who killed Rami, God has chosen him to be like a tool for, for, for Rami to go to heaven. So in that time, I felt I really, like I for, forgave this person. As anniversaries and holidays came and went, Pauline struggled with her decision to forgive. It wasn't until July of 2012 at a church conference, Pauline responded again to a message on forgiveness. I prayed really from an honest heart. And I said, Lord, I really wanna set free those people from, from, from my heart. And I felt such a, 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 a strange feeling in that time. I felt that peace in my heart. And I, I, I felt the joy of the Lord. I, I could feel again that clear voice, you are my daughter and this is why you have to forgive. And as, as Jesus has forgiven me, you know, while I, I was sinner, I have to forgive others for what they have done. And God has given me the, the power of forgiveness after uh, he has given me the, 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 the power of love to those people. Pauline now has a ministry with 14 young widows. She understands their pain and she's able to help and encourage them through this difficult season of their lives. You know, we are all in the same boat. We are all the same, having the same situation. And I always tell them, you are all the daughters of the, the Lord, the King. During our final days here, we had the chance to visit the garden tomb with our group. It is a beautiful place in the middle of a busy city to come and quietly reflect and pray. I just want to read the scripture. I was going through all of the different accounts of, uh, of this place and what it commemorates and God or Jesus being buried. And uh, the account in Mark really struck me because we serve a living God, right? Amen. That tomb is empty for a reason. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. Can we say that together? He has risen. We serve a living God. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. 
there you will see him, just as he told you, trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. Can you imagine? Just, you know, Jesus had said that he was not going to remain here, but just actually envisioning it, actually seeing it, and how uh, probably struck they were by the reality that he was not there. I know that all of us are just going through different things, and I just think as we stand here, again, knowing that that tomb is empty, knowing the promises that Jesus has set before us, knowing that we serve a living God that can do above and beyond what we can ask or think of, that our faith together, all 95 of us, that we can congregate together and pray in Jesus' name for healing. And so we are asking you right now, even, if, even in this cold setting, we are asking you to heal we are asking you to restore. We are asking you that we will not leave this place like we came, that we will feel a touch from you. Having the opportunity to pray for people at the garden tomb, uh, that was one of the most moving experiences for me because we're in the places where Jesus did these miracles and we're praying for healing. Yeah, and Jesus promised that he left us with the power to lay, on the, to lay our hands on the sick and to heal those that are ill. And so it was just so powerful, as you said, Cheryl, to be able to spend that intimate time with our 95 friends, just to say, Jesus is here, the tomb is empty, yeah. that he is risen and we celebrate that today. You know, and Jesus not only did physical healing, you can read about that in the Bible, but also the spiritual healing healing and we're going to pray right now for physical healing and also spiritual healing. What a great day it would be to begin a relationship with Jesus. So Father, we thank you that you are a God that heals. You physically heal people and we pray for that right now. We join our faith together and pray that you would heal people right across Canada and wherever this is being seen because you are a God that heals and we ask that in Jesus name. And I also pray for those that don't know you, have never been in a relationship with Jesus or have drifted away. What a great day it would be to come back into a relationship with you. Because Lord, I, I just sense that you are drawing people today because you love people and you want people to have a relationship with you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this amazing journey throughout the Holy Land. Oh, I feel like I learned so much more. Every time I come here, I take in so much, but I, then I, I think also when you come here, you realize how much more you need to learn. And I always leave these weeks thinking, I wanna read my Bible more. I wanna, I wanna go back over all of these stories and study it again, you know, and just, I don't know. It's just, you realize how much you don't know. I thought I was going to meet and encounter the Jesus that I've always known. And just, it was just gonna, you know, I was going to walk these streets and think, yeah, that just confirms what I know. But um, when people said my life would be changed by coming here, I think it was more my eyes were changed by coming here. My perspective was changed by coming here. And uh, again, as I said, a deeper understanding and a deeper relationship. This is the vicinity where Jesus was and to carry that cross and then to do what he did by dying on the cross, shed his blood so I could have eternal life. I mean, that's something that uh, is deep in my heart. It's the whole thought process of, of him going. It's the whole process of him, the resurrection and you know, the death and the resurrection. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is my savior. This is my savior coming back. You know, and it's, it's remarkable. I really wanted to come home. I feel like I've come home to, to my God, to where he came from. And, and it wasn't so much having questions answered as immersing myself in that life. It matters far beyond even just the physical places that we're visiting. Taking a week out of your life or 10 days or however long it is and saying, I'm just going to learn about my faith. I'm going to seek God in the places that Jesus walked. 
um, there's something about it because in our lives we rarely have the chance to focus on that and really take that time apart. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a sacrifice and it's a commitment and it's, a, and it's an act of devotion. You know when you're in a relationship with somebody and you think you know them and then you, something pops up and you realize, oh, I didn't really know this person. I feel like I really know Jesus now. Like, you know, I've been a Christian for quite a, a long time, um, but this was, this was just different. I, you know, people kept saying, oh, your, your life's gonna be changed. You're gonna go through all of these things. But it was really just like, oh, like understanding Jesus more. I felt like I understood him. And now I'm reading my Bible thinking, I didn't really understand who Jesus was. Like now I truly can say that I understand the streets that he would have walked, the context, the historical context of, of his story, the biblical context. I mean, yeah, I just feel like I understand him on such a more deeper level. And, uh, and it's just changed my perspective of my relationship with him. Again, I think there's times when we do feel that maybe, oh, I'm not sure, is this all true? Is there really a God or whatever people might be thinking when we go through those difficult times? But again, to realize, yes, it's true, and it happened here. It was interesting because, you know what, a lot of uh, the pilgrims that came with us, this was their first time. And I think a lot of them heard me say it was going to be my first time. And so they were uh, felt excited to, to join me on that journey. And uh, again, just seeing how amazing God is and how he speaks to us so individually. Like we are 95 people with very different stories and many different you know realities and day-to-day -day lives. And each person seeing them have an intimate contact with God. We had that healing service and you know, seeing people cry because of the different needs that they had and felt that they were met at that moment or during the journey. I just, again, it's just so fascinating when you think about how God is God, but he speaks to his children in such unique ways. And I think that was my big takeaway from seeing um, the response that 95 different people had. And, and something moved my heart even before I left Canada that God was going to heal me. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, but I just felt like, yeah, this is going to happen. When I think about Easter, um, I'll never think about it in the same way. Yeah, just knowing that we walked the Via Della Rosa. We walked down from the Mount of Olives. We were on the Mount of Olives, but we walked down just as Jesus would have done. and. Um, walked in his footsteps, the Garden of Gethsemane. Even people that aren't Christians sh sh could come and get so much out of it, out of the historical, but I think once they're here, they can't separate themselves from, from the biblical story. I read somewhere um, once that an atheist said, I hate Jerusalem, you can't get within 20 miles of it without feeling the presence of God. And that's so true. On by this man named Jesus, and when you think about all that he went through, when you're walking that Via Della Rosa, when you're, ah, when you go to those sites and you see and you hear what Jesus went through and you actually see it with your eyes, it will give you a deeper understanding of the sacrifice that he paid for us. You know, every Easter we honor that. When you're here, you're living Easter. You are living through Easter. And uh, it is just a very different perce perception of who Jesus is because he's alive. And it brings a huge, as I said, I use the word reflection. It brings a, a deeper reflection of the sacrifice he made and the Jesus that we continue to have a relationship with. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a member of the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. You can write to Crossroads, P.O. Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2. Cheryl Weber's wardrobe provided by Melanie Lynn.